Please state your name and address for the record. Yeah, Walker F. Todd, and I live at 1164 Shearbrook Drive, Chagrin Falls, Ohio, 44022. Now, in the past, have you worked for Fed, some Federal Reserve banks? Yes, I worked from the, uh, for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York from 1974 to 1985, and for the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland from 1985 to 1994. Now, in that capacity, were you... Uh, a lawyer in that capacity there? I was a, a lawyer at the Fed of New York and a lawyer and an economist at the uh, Fed of Cleveland. Okay, in your capacity with those two Federal Reserve Banks, did you require any experience or knowledge and the understanding regarding monetary instruments such as bonds, notes, drafts, bills of exchange, uh, collateral needed for issuance of Federal Reserve notes, or how legal tender is put into circulation? Uh, yes, all of the above. I was one of the resident experts on uh, the monetary functions of the Federal Reserve System uh, at both the Fed of New York and the Fed of Cleveland. Okay, I'm going to hand you a couple of documents, and I'd like to know if you could identify them for me. be a letter from uh, Mr. Russell Monk, who at the time was an Assistant General Counsel for International Affairs at the Treasury Department, uh, dated November 1, 1982. Did you by any chance in your uh, tenure with the Federal Reserve Bank, did you ever happen to meet or do you know uh, Russell L. Monk? Yes, I know Mr. Monk and I met him on several occasions, mostly in the early 1980s, but we've spoken on the phone occasionally since then. Okay, and now can you, in your opinion, uh, would you say he was very knowledgeable in the subject that, uh, for example, if Mr. I wrote or someone wrote him some letters asking him about what is money, how is money in circulation, do you believe in your opinion his answers would be very knowledgeable and, and on point? Yes, I believe that it, it is my opinion that uh, Mr. Monk is the lawyer at the Treasury Department who has the greatest expertise about monetary policy and monetary affairs. Okay, now I'd like to have you look down there at the document you have in front of you. Uh, it's marked uh, paragraph 4, I believe it is. Yes. Uh, now, could you read that into the record? Uh, just a second, and I'm going to ask a couple I'll read, I'll read the paragraph. It says, if the money supply is to be increased, money must be created. The Federal Reserve Board, or the Fed as it's often called, has several ways of allowing money to be created, but the actual creation of money 
always involves the extension of credit by private commercial banks. Okay, now would you, would you in your opinion, from your experience working with the Fed, would that be a true statement? Uh, yes, this is true. This is in fact how the money creation process in the United States today actually works. Okay, so then all money then is created by an extension of credit by private commercial banks. Uh, yes, I will qualify the word all only to the narrow extent that there are various ways involving certain international obligations uh, that the United States holds uh, through which money can be created, but the amount created through that route is trivial, usually no more than 1 to 2 percent of all the money that is circulating. And basically wouldn't be involved with anybody in the interstates or like the uh, state though, of South Dakota. Though that, that's correct. You would never encounter these transactions typically unless you were involved in the international financial markets in New York or in Washington. Okay, now in the next one it's marked paragraph 7. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have you look at that and in there uh, Mr. Monk talks about the goldsmiths and how all this is based upon the practice of the goldsmith. That's how it originally originated. Is uh, that what you see there, and do you believe that would be a true statement? Uh, yes, the statement uh, de described here in paragraph 7 is uh, accurate, with the uh, exception that he wrote this in 1982, and it describes uh, the multiplying of bank reserves by a factor of 6 to create the basic money supply. And uh, due to a change in reserve requirements since then, the current multiplier effect is about 10. 10 for 1 instead of 6 for 1 at that time. Okay. Now I'd like to show you uh, a diagram in the back here. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you just take a few minutes and, and tell me if that kind of actually uh, shows what the goldsmith's practice really was there. Uh, where basically it looks like that uh, diagram it shows where Three people took in and gold, uh, deposited some gold coins, and the uh, gold receipt, uh, the gold uh, smith gave them a receipt for it. Then from that, he expanded the money supply, and we'll use the 10 you just said was common, and then he was able to loan out 30 other people receipts for that same amount of money. Is that, is that correct? That pretty well shows what uh, how our money system was based upon what the goldsmith did. Yeah, yes, the, the basic model is correct. The number would be different under a gold-based system than currently under the uh, so-called fiat money system that is in place in the United States. Under gold, it was generally considered not safe to lend out more than three or four times the actual reserve of coin in the vault. So uh, the number would be different. Uh, if you had three people depositing gold, uh, the takers on the other side, the recipients of uh, receipts for the gold, uh, shouldn't uh, exceed more than 9 to 12, something like that. Mm. But uh, the basic model of fractional reserve banking is derived from the practices of the London goldsmiths in the 17th century, who discovered that they could take in deposits of gold coin, as you described it, and uh, hold them for safekeeping and meanwhile they could lend out receipts for that same quantity of coin to third parties who would use the gold receipts uh, as the equivalent of money to buy goods and services in the local economy and uh, at the appointed time they would repay the goldsmith for uh, the loan of uh, those receipts and as long as the goldsmith managed his business carefully and as I described it, it was considered prudent practice never to lend out more than three to four times the quantity of gold on deposit. And uh, that would be uh, uh, a way for the goldsmith to maintain this business. Okay, and according to Russell L. Monk's uh, letter, <coughs> that that's how the bank creates new money, is by loaning out the additional amount of reserve, uh, the receipts, is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. In the old days, uh, before the 1930s, uh, banks had only two ways of receiving new reserve funds. Either depositors would deposit the money with them that the banks used in their lending business, or capital investors, shareholders, or lenders, bank lenders, other banks typically would provide them startup money. But those were the only ways that banks could acquire the deposit that, that they would lend out. And they basically had to make sure that the amount of loans did not exceed the uh, amount of deposits by very much. Uh, since the 1930s, banking practice has changed so that the bankers uh, are able to uh, raise funds 
through means other than uh, taking in deposits. And that means they've been able to expand the quantity of loans that they make to other people uh, by a much greater factor than was true before. So as we discussed it, even since the time of Mr. Monk's letter in 1982 to the present moment, the ratio or multiplier of loans to reserves has increased from 6 to 10. Okay, now let's move on a little bit to about, to about the period of 1792 when they passed the 1792 Coinage Act. Mm -hmm. Now you had an opportunity to look at that sometime in the past, haven't you? Uh, yes, I've been, uh, I have read the Coinage Act in the past, yes. Okay, now in there, uh, because see, I believe, now when the goldsmiths increased, you know, loaned out extra reserves, Monk and the whole banking system said he created money. But didn't something else happen there also? Didn't he also change the principles of how money worked from principles where money represented production and wealth to where money now represented indebtedness? And the money increase now came from increasing indebtedness, not increase of more actual wealth or more actual production. Yes, as fractional reserve banking, the goldsmith model, increases and expands, you become farther and farther removed from actual production and you're moving farther and farther in the direction of having primarily a debt-based or a debt or credit supported economy instead of uh, money production and wealth creation in the economy. Now in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution says that Congress had the authority to coin money and regulate its value, is that mm -hmm. correct? I guess. Okay, now under the 1792 Coinage Act, that gold basically was come in when the people brought it in to have it coined, didn't it? In other words, the people dug the gold and silver out of the ground, that's where it always comes from. It's a natural resource of the ground or the earth, isn't it? Uh, yes, the, the source of uh, gold and silver is it has to be mined in the first instance. And it always comes out by somebody's human labor. Right. Okay, under the 1792 Coinage Act, isn't it true that they could take that in and have that gold bullion turned into coinage by having the government weigh it and assay it and stamp it into coinage free of charge? <coughs> Uh, yes, uh, and I would comment that I was a little bit surprised and uh, interested when I reviewed the gold, uh, the, sorry, the uh, Coinage Act recently to see that uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, first Secretary of the Treasury who prepared that Coin Act, um, had provided that the minting would be free of charge. Uh, that was an inducement to the people to bring in more gold than otherwise would be the case and to actually thereby create both more gold for the treasury and uh, more gold uh, coin that would circulate in the economy. But see, also there was a principle involved there because that money would have represented wealth to the individual who dug it out of the ground. Because if he took the bullion in, he'd have had the wealth with him, wouldn't he? And after it was coined, mm -hmm. he would have walked out with monetized gold, or he'd have now had money. But there'd have been no debt to anyone, is that correct? Uh, thus far in the transaction, that is correct. Okay, so now if the, if the same guy took the gold in and deposited it in the bank, and he now put the gold in and, and they give him a, a, a receipt, basically that's what a, a gold certificate was, wasn't it? It was a receipt that the money yep. the gold and deposited in the treasury. Okay, now that receipt there would have not changed the principles of money from wealth to debt at all. That would have still been, although you used the paper, you'd have still actually had one for one of the gold deposit, and that money would have still represented wealth to someone. There wouldn't have been no debt in that transaction either, would there? Right. Okay, now if the banker started loaning out excess receipts to other people who had not deposited any coin, he would increase the money supply, wouldn't he? Yes. He would have also switch that money from to evidence of wealth, I mean evidence of debt, wouldn't he? Uh, it would become an evidence of debt with respect to those people who were just borrowing the receipts, yes. Okay, so now as long as you borrow the receipt, it would be possible to give the receipt back, wouldn't you? In other words, you borrow the principal, you could give the principal back. Yes. Okay, but now when it comes to time to pay, pay the interest, you either have to get someone else's principal or you'd have to get some more gold coin to pay the interest, wouldn't you? The gold, but the interest can be repaid in that monetary standard by tendering commodities as well as gold. And at that time, you could, you could tender commodities as well. Commodities as were commonly tendered and commonly accepted, yes. So there wasn't any unusual in, in, in past ever to tender uh, some commodity to pay, uh, or even to give another monetary instrument of right. some sort to pay. If the tape's running, let me run through the first part of the yeah, explanation again. Yeah, you need to go again. ahead. Okay. Uh, 
the first part of the explanation was that in the uh, example we were discussing where the goldsmith lends out his receipt and uh, the borrower uses it in a commercial transaction and he expects to repay the goldsmith with interest after say 90 days after he has financed the shipment of a, uh, a boat to the West Indies to come back with spices for sale in England. The uh, shipper makes a killing on the resale and now he's prepared to pay off the goldsmith. But he can pay off the goldsmith in the principal of the amount of the gold only by finding that defined quantity of gold somewhere in England that he can hand back to the goldsmith. The interest could be accounted for by uh, handing over commodities or whatever other proceeds of the commodities there are, which might indeed turn out to be nothing more than other bills of exchange, paper credit uh, instruments or it could be spices in the case we were discussing, so that uh, the goldsmith would have his choice of these forms of payment, uh, but such forms of payment were commonly offered and commonly accepted in the uh, commercial transactions of the day. Okay, now let's move on up a little bit here, because in the time that you worked for the, for the Fed of New York, you uh, surely must have run on some of their publications they put out I'm sure you must have seen yes. some of these in little forms of funny books and stuff like yes, that. Yes, they're you? famous. They're famous for their comic books. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now that could you identify that one for us? Uh, this is a story of banks uh, that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York uh, issues, or this is an earlier version that they issued through the Public Affairs Department at the time. Okay. Would you turn to page five? I believe it is. And there's a cartoon down at the bottom of here. Uh, could you tell us what that cartoon kind of says? Uh, it shows a uh, lender, I'm uh, sorry, a borrower asking a commercial <coughs> banker for a loan. It says, commercial banks, however, lend in a different way. They create new checkbook dollars and add them to a borrower's checking account. Because commercial banks create almost all new dollars, they play a special role in our financial system. So that basically pretty much says the same thing that Russell L. Monk said, that the, bank is cr the money is created by the bank. Uh, the banks, uh, yes, especially Flexibly. since the 30s, the banking system uh, creates new money essentially by uh, adding deposit amounts to uh, depositors' checking accounts, but for under today's ratios, about 90% of the money thus added, the bank creates the money as an accounting entry. So basically, if I went in to get a loan at the bank, I would go in and we'd agree that I wanted so much money and that I could pay it in a certain way in the future. So I'd sign a promissory note. They would put the promissory note into an asset to the bank, and then they put that much money in their check in my checking account as a liability to me. Uh, or a liability yes. to the bank liability and an asset. To the bank to me. Asset to you, right. And then my loan my note would be a liability to me and an asset to the bank. Right. And that's the way loans are made. Um, Hold it. Take time. Okay. okay. Now, let's go to, because on this next page, I believe it's page six, isn't it? Page uh, six, yes. It goes through a scenario where they kind of explain, and I'd like to have you just read that, if you would, kind of to the court and explain right. how that, what that cartoon particular okay. the whole yeah. page of Yes, this explains how the fractional reserve banking system works currently. The banker says in the first panel, because of the fractional reserve system, banks as a whole can expand our money supply several times by making loans and investments. The next panel says, suppose Westside Bank, with deposits of $1,000, keeps a reserve of 15% or $150. It has the difference, $850, to lend. And so it shows a banker handing a check for the proceeds of the loan to a working man borrower who says, I hope the payments won't be too wrenching. When Westside lends Jake the plumber $850, the funds are put into a new or existing checking account for Jake. Next panel, the banker says Westside takes Jake's promise to repay the loan and creates a demand deposit, money he will spend by writing checks. Next panel says Jake writes a check for $850 to Slick Used Truck Company, which puts Jake's check in its checking account at East Side Bank, Slick's Used Trucks. You got a bargain, Slick says. Next, we see Eastside gaining $850 in deposits and holding a reserve of 15% or $127.50, leaving $622.50 to lend to Helen's beauty spa. That's what I needed, permanent capital, Helen tells her banker. 
Finally, the same banker at the, as at the beginning says, as the process continues with borrowers' funds ending up in different banks, the original $1,000 deposit can expand to more than $6,000. And that explanation, as I said, was based on the ratios of 1982. Under the current reserve ratios, the $1,000 could fund finance loans up to $10,000. But the principle is the same, the only difference is the ratio. The principle is the same, the only, the only difference down. is the ratio. So basically, if you started out with 1000 and ended up with 6000 you'd expanded the money supply up to 6000 right? Yes. And every one of those borrowers that had to pay interest, right? Uh, yes, the borrowers uh, who took the money in the interim would pay interest on the And will is just for illustration purposes, 10% is a nice, easy interest rate figure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now if each one of them, their note come due, and the total money supply was out there at 6000 and it was $6,000 worth of debt owed, so each one of them collectively together would owe the $6,000, right? Yes. Okay, when you added the interest to 10%, the total indebtedness would be 6600 wouldn't it? Uh, yes. Then obviously the debt now would be $600 greater than the total money supply, wouldn't it? Uh, greater than the initial money supply that went into the transactions, yes. Well, we ended up here having only $6,000 altogether, that was right. the total money supply. Right. And it was all owed by these people. Uh, yes. And okay, now also, that when their note comes due, they owe the interest too, don't they? Uh, yes. So now each one of them would owe, if there were six of them, they'd owe $1,000 plus 10%, which would be 600 plus, what's Six dollars more. Six dollars more. Sixty yeah. dollars more. Sixty. But collectively, they would owe six thousand plus six hundred of interest. Yes. So now the total debt each one of them would owe would be six hundred and sixty dollars collectively, but they'd only be six hundred dollars out there in circulation, wouldn't there? Uh, yes. So clearly, all of those people couldn't get out of debt, could they? Not simultaneously. Well, even well, but it, we'll set that if they have to borrow all within the same week, and their debt all came same is due in the right. same week. Uh, obviously, they could no pay to, that to debt. enable them to uh, repay all the interest in the aggregate. It would be necessary for the money system to find some way to either bring new money into the system from the outside, or to uh, uh, what actually happens is to have money turning over faster as time goes on, so that the same quantity of money can handle a slightly larger volume of transactions. In your example, though, normally you would not expect that turnover rate of money, the velocity of money, to expand as much as the interest charge. Uh, but There's usually going to be a shortfall, and that's why money is usually perceived as tight, no matter what the uh, interest rate. But even if you had a faster turnover, which is called velocity mm -hmm. of money, Velocity of money doesn't create any more money, it just creates just more transactions. That, that's correct. The quant basic quantity is the same. So the total amount uh, of money would still only be 6000 no matter how fast these people traded around with each other. That wouldn't increase the money supply any, would it? Uh, no. Uh, the economists have, however, an equation, uh, MV equals uh, IS. Uh, money times velocity equals income uh, Times savings, uh, sorry, income plus savings, so that the uh, uh, basically the money supply that you have is derived from the only possible sources, income and savings. But the quantity of money, depending on its rate of turnover, expands the quantity of money defined to make it equal the other side of the equation. Economists differ theoretically over what this means. Keynesian economists think it doesn't mean very much. Um, uh, proponents of uh, the School of Monetary Thought that I think you're associated with argue that uh, you can't expand the uh, money supply fast enough to keep up with the interest uh, that is charged as well as canceling well. the principal. Uh, and and generally, I think you, you, you have a valid point. Uh, the Keynesians, though, also have a valid point in arguing that if the only thing that matters is interest rates, then the quantity of money becomes irrelevant. Well, but now let's take one of these guys. Let's say, for example, something else happens. We have two guys more enter this scheme instead of the six guys owing the six thousand. We have two other people come in, and, and they 
figure out some little scheme that they don't have to borrow, they just do business with even some of these guys, and they get some of this money out and save. We'll say they say save 3,000 of it and put right. it in their savings account. Right. And we'll just say those guys put it in the mattress. They didn't, right. they didn't trust exactly. the bank. Now, there's only $3,000 with the money in the, out there in the economy that these other people can get a hold of, isn't there? Yes, and in fact, that is more or less a rough model of what happened in the 1930s, that people took their deposits out of the banks and hit, buried them in the backyard or hid them under the mattress, so that the expected quantity of money that would be in the banking system to allow people to repay debts wasn't there when debt repayment time came, and the result was a uh, massive... Uh, uh, a set of foreclosures and, in response, legislative moves to prevent foreclosures in the Great Plains states. Because, see, this whole money system, based upon the goldsmiths, was based upon a fraud, wasn't it? I mean, basically, the concept yes. of getting something for nothing. Yes, yes. They're, they're, here again, economists differ in theory about what's the ideal money system, but one school of thought, and there are some out closely allied schools of thought, either a gold standard uh, uh, banking system, or a 100% reserves banking system. Uh, the proponents of these views would say that what the goldsmiths do is a fraud, and morally it's wrong, it ought to be legally prohibited, and uh, uh, it induces bad behavior in the long run on the part of the general public. Well, basically, though, what it really was, just what all theory aside, just the basic facts, it was one guy figuring out a scam, how to get uh, something for nothing. Because right. basically he didn't have the gold, it wasn't his gold really in the first place, he was just holding it for somebody else. Then he didn't even loan it out, he just loaned the receipt out for it. Mm -hmm. And from there reached much monetary gain without any effort yes. by misrepresenting the facts, didn't he? Yes. And uh, of course, I, I've heard rumors that they put guys in jail for theft by deception, don't they? Uh, yes, I, I am. That, that's a kind of a fact. I'm going to people who suffered that. Okay, now, I, I suppose you should also probably have seen this this document, I think it also uh, came from the yes, Fed. Yes, another of the New York Fed's comic books. This one is on checks and electronic payments. Okay, turn to page uh, 7 there. Mm -hmm. And would you read that cartoon right down the bottom of it there? Uh, okay, underneath a diagram showing a bookkeeping account of how uh, a clearinghouse arrangement or a net settlement arrangement works for checking or electronic funds transfers. You see the banker explaining, more checks are used in the United States today than in any other country. Their history here began in 1681 with a famous experiment called the Fund at Boston in New England. To offset a shortage of hard cash for trade, Boston businessmen mortgaged their land and wares to the fund. In turn, they received a credit against which they could draw checks. This was the uh, ancestor of what was later called the uh, Suffolk Deposit Fund, uh, or the Suffolk Fund, Suffolk County, where Boston was located, uh, for a long time had uh, one of the earliest common clearinghouse arrangements in the United States. By the early 19th century, several other cities had evolved fairly sophisticated bank clearinghouses, and uh, New Orleans, uh, for example, was considered to have one of the most sophisticated and one of the soundest clearing houses in the pre-Civil War era. So this basically would be no different than some people getting together and forming a trust, registered with the Secretary of the State, and mortgaging their wares to the trust, or using putting their stuff in trust, or just using that as an asset to back it, and then issuing instruments on that trust, would it? Uh, that's correct. Uh, the only caveat I would apply to that is that once the trust that you've described is formed, you have to be careful about the applicability of any of the state banking laws to the transactions at hand. Okay, now I'd like to have you uh, kind of explain what that cartoon there right, on that page, I believe it's page, this is page 11. Yes. Okay. okay, underneath a cartoon showing the Federal Reserve's electronic payments network, uh, the banker says, to move money by check, you need a dollar switching mechanism a set of account books where amounts can be subtracted from one account and added to another. Okay, so if I give you a check, and you take that check into the bank, and you deposit that check in the bank, they send it back to the one that issued the check, don't they? Uh, yes. So then the actual only payment that was ever involved in that whole transaction was moving that set of numbers up on, over on the, on the booking system. 
I mean, the check wasn't payment in of itself, was it? The, uh, the check no. wasn't payment. No. So the actual payment was nothing but, but the numbers on it, was it? Uh, right, the accounts are debited or credited at both ends of the transaction, and that's what happens. So that's really all we use for money today is just the accounting on the, on the uh, just put numbers in the accounting system. Yes, much more increasingly, in fact, since that comic book was printed, uh, uh, the banking system has evolved in the direction of electronic funds transfers and electronic payments, so that uh, the dollar volume of the electronic transfers is increasing. It's not as large as checks yet, I believe, but it's rapidly closing the gap, and it's foreseeable sometime early in the next century that uh, there will be far more dollar value transacted in the economy via electronic payments only uh, than by check. Okay, and since uh, 1933, we really, uh, before that, like in, 17, in 1792 Coinage Act, there was a clear definition of the word dollar, wasn't there, in, in the written statute? I mean, it was an actual law that defined what a uh, dollar was. Yes, yes, the Coinage Act defined what a dollar was, right. Okay, and since that time, that's basically being abandoned and they don't have any definition of a dollar anymore. Uh, yes, between 1792 and, 17, uh, and 1933, uh, the Coinage Act definition was the uh, standard definition of the term, and uh, it was generally observed except during periods of temporary suspension in wartime. For example, during the War of 1812 and during the Civil War and for a few years afterward. But with the exception of these expansion of uh, these suspension periods, uh, the 1792 definitions were the governing definitions of the day regarding what a dollar is. Okay, so the basic today, all the dollar is is just simply numbers on a piece of paper that have no value in and of themselves, and and uh, the federal statute says money doesn't have to have any value in and of itself. It just has to be something written down. Yes, uh, the economists explain this uh, distinction by saying that the dollar before 1933 was both a unit of account and a unit of exchange. That is, it was an accounting entry that told you the third party value or the market value of an object, uh, but at the same time, as a unit of exchange, the dollar had a tangible physical presence and value and uh, so it was both a unit of account and a unit of exchange. It's fair to say that since 1933, the dollar has served the functions only of a unit of account, and it no longer has the function of a unit of exchange. So back to what we were talking about in this first comic book, you made the comment if the debts were to be paid, they'd either have to be some new money brought into the system somehow, or, or it indeed would be impossible for all the people to pay off their debts, wouldn't it? Uh, yes, in fact, it's fair to say that in the simple models of a monetary system, the standard assumption is that toward the end of the period observed, some new player will enter the system, providing a new deposit to a bank somewhere that injects uh, just enough new money to allow the transactions booked in an earlier era to be cleared through the banking system now. And in the absence of that entry of a new supply of money sufficient to cover the interest that is due, the transactions could not clear. Now, uh, obviously, if I issued you just any note, basically, promised to pay, that would be clearly a new asset on the books of the bank, where they'd have new assets, right, wouldn't they? Uh, yes, uh, under standard negotiable instruments law, or the Uniform Commercial Code, uh, rights in the uh, collateral, please go ahead, yeah. rights in the collateral would uh, uh, attach on both sides, uh, or rights in the instrument would attach on both sides when value is given. The question is what is value, but uh, as long as each side is happy with the value received in the transaction, then. Uh, uh, the negotiable instrument you gave, the promissory note, uh, is an asset on the books of the bank. In fact, uh, the government just put out a new document called the uh, CRS Report on for Congress, uh, Money in the Federal Reserve System, Myth and Reality, and, and you have the opportunity to have at least looked at that yes, one. Yes, I've yes. And on page 12, it states there that debt makes very good money, doesn't it? 
Uh, yes, the phrase uh, used by the Congressional Research Office staffer who wrote this is, uh, debt makes good money because the debt of one person or institution is an asset to whomever it is owed, which is the point we were just discussing. Okay. So, basically, our whole money system is based upon promissory notes, aren't they? Uh, since 1913, that has more or less been the case. And since 1933, or at the latest, World War II, uh, yes, it's promissory notes, but increasingly it's promissory notes of the government as distinct from promissory notes of individuals. Okay, so now, uh, basically though, this system is designed basically to benefit the banks, aren't they? I mean, the bank is always the one that gets the interest off the original loans, right? Yes, this is one of the advantages of fractional reserve banking, that uh, once the government officially licenses and authorizes this system as the official standard banking system, uh, the principal winners in that system are those who receive the benefit of the interest payments on loans. Uh, that may be depositors, but typically in a lesser proportion uh, than uh, the owners, the shareholders, the management of the bank. But in order for anyone to pay interest, it has to come from someone else's bank loan, doesn't it? Uh, that's the normal source of the interest money is either loans or the bank's investments in securities which also pay interest or dividends. Which basically is invested which is the same in thing as interest. Yeah. Right. right. Okay, so if the bank receives money in on the loan, and, and now when you, when, you, when you create money as a loan, the money's created when the loan is made. And when you pay off that loan, the principal is extinguished, right? In other yes. words, you, you create $100, when you pay it back, $100 minus $100 is, is zero. So that money's gone again, just like it was created when the loan was made, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but now the interest comes from the second, somebody, in order to pay interest, someone has to go out in the economy and collect, capture somebody else's loan principal. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, now if I take that, what I collect, uh, captured off of somebody else's loan principal, takes it into the bank. Now the bank does two things with that. They hold part of it as a cash reserve and don't spend it, and they spend the other part of it back in to pay their operating expenses. Is that correct? Right. That's correct. Okay. Now, so if they don't spend all that money in and keep that part of that out, then somebody else that's out there is going to have a hard time. They're not even going to have the money to pay the principal back, much less the interest, aren't they? Uh, you can, well, the Fed tries not to so manage the system to produce that result. But it is theoretically possible, and on occasion it has happened. Yes, that but it's not only at least theater. regionally in the in the in the thirties, nobody anywhere had any money. But in the nineteen eighties and later, uh, the common phenomenon was what we called regional recessions or rolling recessions that moved from one part of the country to another. So that in South Dakota, for example, in the early to mid nineteen eighties. Uh, the phenomenon may have been that uh, there was net shrinkage of the money available to the banking system locally so that uh, anyone who was trying to obtain the money to pay back a debt would perceive that there was no money to be had. Uh, there, there was uh, uh, a net shortfall between uh, the amount required to keep the debts all circulating in the local economy versus the amount that was actually available. And that was really actually needed in order for some other so segment of the economy to be able to have enough money for them to not have a recession, is not that true? Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, basically, there was uh, a fair argument could be made during the 1980s that uh, as in the early part of the century uh, in the transactions that gave rise to the creation of the Federal Reserve Act, that uh, net monetary reserves in the banking system flowed to the financial market in New York or offshore for speculative loan investments uh, and uh, were sucked out of uh, local economies uh, in the heartland. Uh, and uh, I think the consequence of that is that uh, when debt repayment time comes, uh, there just is not the money available in a particular region at a particular time that would be required to clear all the current debts. So then the, basically the bank gets to put out money that they basically didn't have, they got to create, and then if they 
yeah. create a shortage in one area so the other people can have money to function, then basically they get to foreclose and actually take real tangible assets for nothing, don't they? Uh, what probably happened, uh, especially in agricultural lending in the early to mid-1980s in the heartland, was that banks optimistically financed loan projects at a given value or assumed value of land and crops uh, at the beginning of the loan. But when the loans fell due, the markets had already turned against the borrowers and then indirectly against the banks who had made the loans, so that the money was not available to repay the loans uh, on the original assumption. Uh, this is one of the great never-ending problems of the American economy. In a classical economy prior to the 1930s, the assumption would be that the bankers and the borrowers would just have to work out an adjustment in which the bankers agree to take less as a pay down on principle of the loan and the borrowers agree to give up a little more either in hog form of higher interest or a fractional portion of the land in the case of the farmer. Uh, but you would not have had this all or nothing uh, contest that emerged in the 1980s where the banks might demand uh, payment in full or we take all of your land. Okay, now, have you ever, you're aware of the concept of going in and basically rolling over your debt, or in other words, paying your debt off with another promise? With a new loan, typically at a higher interest rate, yes. But see, when you have that problem, you simply have to borrow more to pay off what you borrow. Yes. So basically, you really can't get out of debt doing that. All you can do is just keep constantly raising the debt level. Is that correct? Yes. Typically, in most cases, principal rises, even if initially interest rates fall because you found that borrowers willing to lenders willing to make loans at lower rate. But over time, uh, things tend to even out so that you're in debt for a higher amount, typically borrowed to pay principal plus interest on the earlier loan. But the first day of your new loan, you show principal only on the new loan. So the interest actually becomes. It represents a lower amount of principal plus a margin of interest for the prior loans. Right. And so the interest actually becomes new principal is what really happens. Uh, right. The interest gets added into the new principal. We call that capitalization of interest. Okay. Now, in all this, what we've talked about so far. There's never even been such a thing as a Federal Reserve note, a piece of paper money to represent. Everything here has just been a bookkeeping entry from day one. Uh, yes, everything we've discussed could be handled in the banking system without using actual currency notes. Okay, so now if currency notes were to enter into the picture, isn't it a true statement that the only way that they can enter in is when someone takes a bank credit that they borrow from the bank and go, go to the bank and buy the, the Federal Reserve notes at face value with the bank liabilities they had in their account? Uh, yes. So in other words, these Federal Reserve notes can't even enter into the picture until somebody, they really don't increase or decrease the money supply, they just give a physical form to the bank liability, isn't that true? Uh, yes, to, to, and typically to just a fraction of the bank's liability. Well, yeah, because obviously there's never been enough printed to give a right. uh, physical form to all the bank liabilities, has uh, Right, the current, my guess is that the current quantity of notes in circulation versus uh, deposit liabilities it probably is no greater than about 25% of total bank liabilities. So there's probably, we'll say, now M1 money we'll talk about is basically checks and uh, traveler's checks and checkbook money and Federal Reserve notes, right? Uh, M1 is, yes, uh, things short of savings accounts, yes. And so basically what, uh, of the total M1, Tony, only 25% of the total money that you have. Well, no, M1 is a small measure. They're, they're, they're Currency tends to support uh, upward of 40% to 50% of M1 or M1A. So currency could be up as high as 40% of that. Yes, but uh, if you're if you were willing to throw savings accounts into the mix, savings accounts and CDs, uh, that would be kind would, of what they call it, M2. Yes, you're, yeah. you're out in the neighborhood of M2, and there you're uh, even with uh, currency only supporting maybe 25% of the total. Okay, so there, the, the higher the, in the M's you get, the lower the, the lower percentage, percentage of actual <laughs> bill that was ever created to act, you know, to even exist for those liabilities, is that correct? Uh, right. Okay, so now then, basically, in order to pay off that debt and really have something that debt-free that you don't shift the debt onto the neighbor, you'd have to bring some new money in from some place, wouldn't you? 
Yes, new money would have to enter the system okay. in the aggregate for this. Now, this in order to get those Federal Reserve notes printed, as I understand it, or is this correct, <laughs> that the Treasury themselves, the Bureau of Printing and Graving, actually prints the bills? Uh, yes, uh, the way the Federal Reserve note issuance process works, uh, uh, the notes originate at the Treasury's uh, Bureau of Printing and Engraving, and they are shipped then to reserve banks. Uh, in the old days, the reserve banks would add a seal dis distinctly identifying the reserve bank to the note and then issue them into circulation. It was a, essentially a two-step process, first at the Treasury shipping the notes to the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve adding the seal and then issuing the notes. Uh, the modern era, basically since the mid-1970s, uh, the Treasury does the whole process of printing and the Federal Reserve System in the aggregate issues the notes. Okay, now also, is it correct that when the Fed gets those notes, they actually pay for the cost of the printing and they put up collateral equal to the base value? Uh, the Fed uh, is required as a condition of issuing notes to deposit uh, collateral uh, with the Treasury or with the Federal Reserve agent, uh, depending on how the note is issued, uh, equal uh, to the face value of the notes, yes. Okay, and uh, the, the cost of printing is paid as a separate account entry by the Fed. It's paid as a, a that, separate charge, a separate cost, but it does not require collateral for that portion. And that's really nothing that they, they just a bookkeeping entry that the Fed uses for that? Uh, yes, once again, they, it's typically an offset uh, by the Fed uh, against uh, charges that it makes to the Treasury uh, for the currency services performed for the Treasury. So it's just a basic bookkeeping transfer there. Yes. Okay, now, there are different kinds of, uh, basically, uh, I have another letter from the Treasury written by him, uh, from uh, M.M. Snyder, and basically in that one there, it's months, that's it. It says that uh, there's four basically kinds of collateral that they can use, isn't it? Uh, yes, they uh, describe the currently acceptable forms of um, currency collateral as gold certificates, special drawing rights of the uh, IMF, U.S. government securities, and eligible paper. Now there, there are a few others that, that are, can be added, but they're minor and inconsequential. And now that eligible paper, now that's basically based upon uh, notes and drafts and bill of exchange and a lot of it with notes on agricultural products, isn't that correct? Uh, yes, uh, this, the relevant statutory section comes out of the original Federal Reserve Act of 1913 and uh, it allowed originally for the pledges of notes, drafts, bills of exchange, that's ordinary commercial obligations that arise in uh, standard trade within the country, uh, typically maturing in 90 days or less after the date of issuance. And for agriculture, uh, that would be agricultural promissory notes or drafts, uh, uh, maturing in up to six months after issuance. Okay, so if someone give you a note and you took it in and the bank endorsed it, it could actually be used as collateral. The bank could use that as collateral to get brand new Federal Reserve notes into the bank, couldn't they? Uh, yes, the bank would uh, accept your note, uh, endorse it, and then hand that note over to the Federal Reserve Bank, in your case in Minneapolis, and uh, the local bank can obtain credit from the Minneapolis Fed on the basis of your note. So that would actually be a way to bring new money into circulation without anyone actually having to borrow from the bank, wouldn't it? Uh, that is, what, issuing a promissory note well, yeah. to the uh, If someone bank. issued a promissory note and the, and the bank took it and endorsed it and used it to, and, give it and send it on to the Fed to use as collateral. Okay, okay. Here there is a minor technical problem. Um, you, by accounting conventions and the bank examination standards, you would be charged with a borrowing by the mere act of signing and handing over a promissory note to a bank, even if you did not intend to, quote, borrow money, end quote, in the process. So, in other words, the, the, the banking system has it pretty well set up that no one can get out of this system and everybody has to stay in this system 
and where they are sure that they now have the title to every piece of land in the, and every piece of property in the nation now, haven't they? Because uh, they basically have a, a note on everything, don't they? Uh, well, all the home mortgages and the like, yes, or typically financed through the banking or the thrift industry system. Uh, banks don't own or control everything, but probably it's fair to say they own or control almost everything. Well, they basically have a mortgage on just about everything, either one way or the other, don't yeah. they? Because yeah, that's what uh, I mean by control is uh, through devices like mortgage financing absolutely. for homeowners and uh, well, uh, through uh, working capital loans for businesses. Now, it's clear that obviously a few bankers can't live in every home and drive every car. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Uh, yes. And can't drive every tractor. But if they can buy a little bit of hook and crook in the back, in the back of smoky filled rooms. They get a little legislation passed that nobody can do business without coming to the bank and borrow the money. They pretty well got a lock on everything, don't they? Um, they, they, in some states, they like to try that game. Uh, it's uh, their success depend varies from state to state. However, uh, uh, typically in legislatures, you find a free for all contest between distinct interest groups in the financial services industry. You might have, for example, insurance agents and the insurance industry on one side of an issue, bankers on the other side of the same issue, securities broker dealers, securities firms in the middle, forming a free-floating coalition where the securities firms line up with whichever faction they think will do them the most good on a given day, the bankers or the insurance agents. But and that's how the legislative game typically works. That's okay. okay, then basically it doesn't make any difference whether you're an insurance company or whether you're a brokerage firm. All, uh, all the money they use is basically originally it came from some bank as, as a loan to someone, did it? Yes, that is typically how the uh, money supply is created or expanded. That it, in the modern American fiat money scheme, most of uh, in the modern fiat money scheme, the uh, uh, the banks uh, are the principal source of money creation. It's fair to say that in the United States they're almost the exclusive source. Some new gold and silver is dug out of the West each year and uh, minted or otherwise transformed into money, but uh, as against the total expansion of the money supply each year, the amount that's added through new gold and silver uh, coming into the system is trivial. But see, even that that's minted really is can't be used as money because, being you brought that up, I have a, a coin there and it says as I, if you can identify that. Uh, this appears to be a Liberty Silver Dollar issued in 1992. And it's clearly, it says on its face it's a one dollar, right? Uh, yes, one dollar silver. Mm -hmm. But obviously nobody could take, nobody could go down to the coin dealer and buy that for six Federal Reserve notes and turn around and spend it for one dollar worth of goods, could they? Uh, no, at current, right? current market prices, it's worth what, about five dollars and a half or something like that. So it'd be kind of silly right. to go down and, and take. Uh, well, now wait a minute. That brings up another point. How can one dollar be worth five and a half dollars? What's the value of a dollar? Uh, you were dealing there with the commodity value of money versus uh, the legal tender or lawful money value of, of money. So then, this thing, in other words, its lawful value money is way less than its commodity money. Value. Its legal tender value is worth much less than its uh, commodity value. But wasn't under the 1792 Coinage Act, wasn't the value of the money determined by the weight and purity of the metal or the, uh, the commodity in the coinage? Yes, under that act, uh, and this principle is generally observed for the next 140 years, uh, the value of a dollar coin was to remain constant over time there being no difference between the face value or legal tender value of the coin and the actual commodity value of the coin. And while there were periodic fluctuations during recessions or wartime in the value of gold or silver coin, uh, after the war or the emergency, typically the coin value, uh, the market value, commodity value, returned to the original face value in the recovery period that followed. So that if you look at a graph of the price of gold or silver from 1792 to 1933, you'll see that the underlying trend of the graph line is flat. That is, essentially, the gold or silver coin maintained the same constant value from 1792 to 1933.
Okay, now, uh, if someone goes to the bank and they won't make him a loan, he's basically shut out of the whole economic cycle because he can't get the capital to do business with. Isn't that pretty much correct? Uh, yes, it's difficult uh, for anyone who has not inherited wealth or receiving a municipal munificent gift from family to uh, uh, be able to raise startup capital. So basically what they have done to us is put us in financial bodies, haven't they? Just absolutely made us slaves to the banks because unless we're willing to borrow and be in debt to the banks, they basically shut us out of any ability to do business on a, any major scale amount of anything. I think that was an intended outcome of government policy from the early 1930s throughout the post-World War II era down to sometime in the mid-1970s when there began to be a few cracks in the wall. Uh, I believe that increasingly as time goes on, it will be a little more difficult to maintain a situation where bankers have an exclusive monopoly on the creation of money or instruments that look like or can be used as the equivalents of money. Uh, but certainly at the time that we're discussing in your case, the early to mid-1980s, it would be fair to say that while the cracks had begun appearing in the wall, they weren't very big yet. And uh, they were certainly were not as large as they are today. And that was clearly a violation of the 13th Amendment, involuntary servitude to the bank, wasn't it? Because if you didn't want to serve them, you, they simply come out and took away your property, or you kept borrowing yeah. from them, or you didn't get any property in the first place. Isn't I, that true? I, I, I won't follow you down that path because the uh, uh, involuntary servitude has a particular technical meaning in the uh, 13th Amendment, and uh, uh, the courts have routinely rejected uh, claims that uh, taxation or uh, uh, indebtedness to bankers or things of that sort do not constitute the forms of involuntary servitude that are prohibited thereby. Well, and of course, the courts always are bad with the bankers, aren't they? I mean, I've never, I've every judge I've ever checked into sets on the board of a bank. Uh, never checked into one yet that isn't set on the board of a bank. Uh, federal judges typically do not. Yeah, every one that I've checked into has. I am surprised and amazed because banks have cases that come before federal judges, it might be a conflict of interest, you should look into that. Well, I had an attorney that checked on every judge she knew, and she never found State one. judges is another, federal another judges. story, right? Federal judges. Federal, uh, it is, or I, let's say that a no, federal we'll judge might, yeah, yeah, a federal judge might sit on the board of a or state Or at least bank. held bank stock, we'll put it this way, at least or held, bank, held stock. bank stock. Held bank stock's another story, okay, that's more common uh, uh, thing in the uh, society. Uh, I, uh, while bank stock is widely held, we have not yet reached a point where everybody owns bank stock. Um, my guess is that if you took a survey of uh, households and asked uh, how many of you own bank stock, uh, the current answers might be in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 percent of households. It, it certainly would not exceed that number. Okay, let's go to the cracks in the wall that he was talking about. How, exp expound on a little bit about these cracks, uh, how this uh, new uh, features of money is beginning to make it harder and harder for the banks to maintain after the control. Well, um, you and I once uh, discussed uh, the issuance of new monetary devices in the banking system and also outside the banking system, uh, such as smart cards, electronic money transfer cards. Uh, that's probably the most glaring illustration of this, this principle. Um, as computer technology has advanced, it has become possible to embed a computer chip in the, something that looks like a credit card. And because it has the chip that is, has an intelligence and a memory capacity, you can change the value of the card electronically by sending electromagnetic signals through the chip. So. Uh, in uh, uh, test of these devices during the Atlanta Olympics recently, for example, some of the banks issued $100 smart cards. Uh, the way you would have paid them would be walk into a banking office, pay $100, you would receive the card in exchange, you would probably pay the bank a dollar or two for a service charge for the card. Uh, and uh, uh, 
then as you go around to merchants who were set up to uh, record transactions with the card, uh, your card would be debited and the merchant's account would be credited for the value of the transaction. Uh, it would work more or less the same way as the Washington DC subway system works with its uh, fare cards. Um, in any event, uh, uh, banks can issue these things now and are in fact issuing them. Uh, there is nothing in the law, in most states at least, that prohibits non-banks from issuing smart cards. So uh, in theory, over time, I think you're going to find uh, uh, banks, uh, merchants, uh, and perhaps even some wealthy individuals issuing payment cards. Uh, and while in the initial phases of this project, uh, the banker or other seller of the card might require you to pay in full up front for the value of the card, it is uh, foreseeable and indeed it's already happening that banks would be uh, tempted to follow the goldsmithing principle of fractional reserve banking and uh, float the card out there without requiring payment in full up front so that down the road a banker might require a payment of only some small fraction of the face value of the card in advance and allow people to carry cards on the street. Uh, the question then arises once the card is in circulation is it money outstanding in the system, like currency? And should it be treated legally as, it were, <coughs> as though it were the equivalent of currency? Or instead, should uh, the monetary authorities keep their hands off and let the market evolve different solutions for what to do about smart cards? Uh, currently, the Federal Reserve's position, as I understand it, is bifurcated with uh, bank examiners and some lawyers saying that we might have enormous problems down the road in summing up the liabilities of banks if smart cards are in circulation without adequate reserves being maintained against them uh, versus uh, some economists and I think Chairman Greenspan takes this view uh, that uh, we should keep hands off and let the market evolve its own solutions to smart cards. Talking about reserves, what do the banks actually use for reserves right now? What is actually held for 90% of the reserves? Uh, well. I, let me rephrase your question if I understand it right. Uh, I think you're saying for uh, bank deposits they maintain reserves on uh, uh, a fraction of the deposit. Uh, currently that fraction is 10%, so 90% of bank deposits is free of reserves. There are no reserves. It's just a bookkeeping and true. And uh, the remaining 10% in theory has to be real money held at the Fed but the banker in turn may borrow that money from another bank, some or all of that money. And uh, so you might have a summing up of uh, bookkeeping transactions there as well, with uh, Bank A using some of Bank B's money to satisfy Bank A's own reserve requirements. But also, basically, don't the reserves actually stem from government debt, though? Isn't that where the basic reserves are created for the bank? Yes, the monetary base of the Federal Reserve is uh, 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 essentially Federal Reserve notes outstanding that were used by the Fed to acquire government debt instruments. So that, uh, yes, the basis of uh, the reserves of the Federal Reserve system is uh, ultimately uh, outstanding U.S. government debt. So basically, if we got rid of the government debt, we really wouldn't have any reserves, would we? Under the way the system works currently, there would be no reserves, although the statute is worded in such a way that the Fed could use other things as the basis for reserve creation. In fact, before 1933, the Federal Reserve relied fairly heavily on uh, private uh, commercial transaction instruments as the basis for creating the Basically, reserves. farmer's notes and... Farmer's notes, notes, merchant's notes, things of that sort. This is basically what this case is all about, is basically... Uh, yes, that's before. right, that's right. In the old days, a note by when the, you tendered might have been used as the basis for uh, reserve creation. And if we uh, really did balance the budget and, and drop the deficit and also drop the debt, they'd have to return to something like that, wouldn't they? Uh, yes, basically they would have no choice, and in fact some Keynesian economists are worried about that. I personally am not, but uh, should the glorious day ever arrive when there is so little government debt in circulation that the banks just can't get their hands on it, and therefore can't use it as a basis for money creation, 
the banking system would have little choice but to turn to private sector transactions as a new basis for money creation. So basically, what I tendered would be nothing but what's happened in the past and probably what we're headed to in the future. It just and it wouldn't hurt the bank any if they accepted, endorsed it, and used it for collateral for Federal Reserve notes. In fact, the whole system would be very smooth, and everybody, in essence, would have a, a more of an asset and have more money than what they had before, wouldn't they? Well, we've drawn three or four conclusions there that you might want to split up. Okay. Uh, first of all, Let's has things like this have things like this happened in the past? Yes. Uh, private uh, financial instruments have often been used as money or near money or substitutes for money in uh, economies, especially remote from urban centers uh, out in the country, out in South Dakota, for example, in the old days, uh, or uh, in particular industries or uh, even in, in urban centers like the garment industry in New York, uh, trade bills or trade acceptances may uh, pass as a common form of a substitute for money among garment merchants. Um, so at various times private financial instruments uh, have been used and are generally recognized as uh, a form of money depending on the particular economy you're dealing with. Uh, the great economist Alfred Marshall in his standard textbook on money and credit uh, noted that um, money should be received, perceived not as something that is sharply defined uh, uh, at any point in time, but rather as a continuum, a spectrum, where at one end you have something that no one will question as money, like gold or silver coin or bullion, and at the other end you might have private financial instruments and government paper would be somewhere in the middle of this uh, spectrum. Uh, but all of these transactions that we have described here, from bullion at one end through government securities to private financial instruments, all of them may be viewed as money and have been used as money at various times in the past and still are being used as money today in, in various parts of the U.S. economy. And if the government would take this uh, note and put it on their books, they'd have a brand new asset and they would actually be better off than they were before, wouldn't they? Uh, again, break that question up into two concepts. Should the government take your note? The government has the right to take your note if it wishes to do so, but under the relevant Federal Reserve Act provisions and statutes, uh, the Fed cannot be compelled to take your note. Uh, it has the right to examine it and refuse it if it has doubts about its credit worthiness. Uh, so basically then, but wait a minute, I thought the, I thought the Fed was government, I thought it was a government agency. The, the reserve banks are not government agencies uh, But the by people law. who make the decisions are down to the Fed Reserve Board, right? Uh, there are these, no, there are different uh, classes of, uh, 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 well, government status regarding within the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve Board in Washington was chartered originally as just the federal agency that oversees a semi-private, semi-public network of glorified national banks called Federal Reserve Banks. So the Federal Reserve uh, is split into two main parts. The Federal Reserve Board functions as sort of a government agency that oversees the operations of a semi-public, semi-private network of Federal Reserve banks, which were originally conceived of as just glorified national banks and where they were located and what they would do. Uh, so uh, the people who are making these decisions on lending and credit at the Federal Reserve banks are not government agents. And uh, under the relevant legislative history and the relevant court cases, the board cannot order the Federal Reserve banks to make a loan to any particular borrower or to accept any particular collateral. However, in actual practice, especially since the 1970s, the Federal Reserve Board has tended to dominate the reserve banks to behave as though it's the headquarters and the reserve banks are just the branches, order takers. And the board staff on occasion has made it very plain to reserve banks that unless they make credit decisions the way the board wants them made, that it will be taken out of the salary and budget hides of the reserve banks and their employees. So they basically do control them. And so basically if they really had the best interest of the government in mind, they would 
uh, take the asset and put it on the book, uh, which would be much better than taking uh, someone's land out there that's a, you know, a, a really good producer. I mean, it would be very better for the whole economy, wouldn't it? For the benefit In of a hypothetical world. case, yes, you have to look at the particulars of each case to make that decision on any particular note. The standard note, the standard theory is that yes, it's, uh, uh, the government is better off owning the financial instrument than it is owning the land or the underlying means of production. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I thank you very much. That'll end that question for this point in time. And uh, we may recall your, or redo this, but at this point in time, and I do thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you.